Our next speaker is Professor Dave Dawson. Um, I've been looking at his CV and I think it would turn most of us green with envy. A degree in biology, a PhD, author of more than 260 articles on ecology and conservation, a plethora of awards, he was Social Innovator of the Year in 2010, the Award for Conservation Biology in 2013, British Ecological Society Public Engagement Award in 2014-15, and number eight in the BBC Wildlife Magazine's list of the top 50 most influential people in conservation. <laughs> then I noticed that there's a pattern. So he's born in Shropshire, lectured in Southampton, moved to Stirling, now lives in Sussex. And obviously, living in Sussex <coughs> leads to success. So, there we go. Dave, floor's yours. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just going to move this, it's sort of in the way. I'm not going to do a dance one. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you about bees at some point, but not straight away. Um, I'm going to start with talking more broadly. Um, I think kind of the issues with bees exemplify many of the other environmental problems that we face. Um, and maybe can help us solve those problems. But I'm going to start off by talking about this place. Um, some of you will know why I'm talking about this place, but I think it's a really interesting example, something we should learn from. So this, of course, is Easter Island, so I can't actually really see it, but I'm sure you can. Um, famous for these bizarre sculptures, um, but it has a really interesting history. So, so Easter Island is in the Pacific, it's really remote, it's hundreds of miles from anywhere else that's habitable. Uh, and it was colonised by Polynesian people sailing eastwards across the Pacific in dugout canoes. And when they arrived, uh, the island was densely forested, um, it had flightless plump uh, pigeons running around on the forest floor which were good to eat, and there were seabirds that nested there so you could collect the eggs or the young seabirds and eat those. And the soil was quite fertile, the sea was full of fish. So they settled and, and life was good and they started clearing trees to farm and eating the birds and so on. Um, and the civilization grew, we think, to about 10,000 people at its peak. And life was good enough that they had leisure time to carve these strange statues and drag them around the island and arrange them. Um, but what happened next is the really interesting bit. So it was then rediscovered by European explorers about 500 years after it had been colonized. And when they arrived, the human population had crashed. There were maybe, we don't know for sure, but maybe a thousand or so people left. They were starving, they turned to cannibalism, they were eating rats. Um, so what had gone wrong? Well, by clearing the land and taking away the tree cover, they'd, allowed the, they'd exposed the soil to erosion, so the soil had slowly washed away into the sea. And they'd actually cut down all the trees, every single tree. So um, when the islands were rediscovered, there was literally no, nothing apart from grassland on the whole island. So as the soil washed away, the crop yield started to drop. They'd eaten all the flightless birds, they went extinct. Uh, they ate so many seabird eggs that the seabirds stopped nesting there. Without wood, they couldn't build houses or make cooking fires or make boats to go fishing or leave. So they were in big trouble and they starved to death, basically. And the reason I'm telling you this is you can make a pretty good argument that we are doing exactly the same thing, but on a global scale, that these people did. And it's also interesting because we know we're doing it and we're not stopping. And they must have had, the, they must have had some knowledge that they were using up their resources. Somebody chopped down the last tree. The island was small enough that they must have known it was the last tree, but they still chopped it down, which is kind of fascinating. Um, and you think, well, how stupid, but all my life we've been clearing the world's tropical forests. Everybody knows it's a really dumb thing to do, but we're still doing it. Um, and, uh, and there seems to be no sign at all of us stopping. There are other parallels too. So, um, so we're clearing land for agriculture, just as they did. <laughs> That's leading to soil erosion, just as it did on Easter Island. Um, it's worse in some places than others, but it's overall estimated that we're losing about 100 billion tonnes of topsoil from the surface of the earth every year, which is a big number, hard to get your head around, but it's, that's fi about 15 tonnes for every person on the planet every year being lost. Some of that goes into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. 
A lot of it goes into rivers, which it silts up, uh, which does lots of ecological damage and leads to flooding. Ultimately, it ends up in the sea, where it buries coral reefs and causes all sorts of problems there. So the loss of the soil itself is obviously serious because it, it, we need soil to grow crops, but it's also causing lots of other problems as well. Um, this is just uh, uh, shows you the, a river in Madagascar, a photograph taken from space, and it's bright red because that's just the, the red soils of Madagascar washing out into the Indian Ocean. You might think that that's something that mainly happens in the tropics, but it isn't. So uh, this, these are terrible pictures. Um, shows different periods of time. You can, uh, you can understand why in 1850 the pictures were pretty rubbish, but I really don't know why this picture is so poor. <laughs> um, but it shows a, a, a fairly famous post, um, Holm Post in uh, Cambridgeshire, which is a uh, it, it's slightly odd, I don't know why, but somebody in 1850 thought it would be a good idea to drive a great metal post into the ground. Um, but what's interesting is that ever since it's been rising magically out of the ground, and it now stands about 15 feet tall, but it's not actually that the post has been rising up, it's that the ground has been falling. Um, East, East Anglia used to have spectacularly deep and rich and fertile soils, but we've lost 15 feet of them. Um, into the atmosphere, into the sea, and so on. So it's happening here too. Just as they drove the tree species and the flightless bird species uh, on their island extinct, uh, we're doing the same. So we're currently losing maybe 10,000 species per year from the planet, um, which means that probably while I'm talking, on average, one species somewhere will go extinct, which is pause for thought. Um, and there are realistic projections. We don't know what's going to happen by the end of this century, but some estimates suggest we might lose two-thirds of all species on the planet by the end of this century if we carry on that current trajectory. Does that really matter? A lot of people, what really worries me is I don't think many people actually care so much about this. And so this is an interesting quote, which I think in some ways sums up many people's attitudes to extinctions. Because uh, people do care about big things, about rhinos or whatever, but I don't think they care broadly about this massive loss of biodiversity. So this is a quote from Marcel Berlin. I've no idea who he is, and I hope he's not here, because this would be awful if he is. But, um, so he wrote, Should we worry about the endangerment of all species? Pandas and tigers, for sure. But armadillos? I don't I like armadillos. I don't know if any thought against armadillos. But anyway, um, I passionately believe in saving the whale, as if there's just one or something, um, the tiger, the orangutan, and the sea turtle, but many of the specific, uh, but many, sorry, I lost the way. I passionately believe in saving the whale, the tiger, the orangutan, the sea turtle, and many other specifically identified species. So they only count if they've been identified. I don't know if he's aware, but we've maybe identified somewhere between a fifth and a tenth of all the species on Earth. But as far as he's concerned, they don't matter if we haven't yet given them a name, which seems slightly odd. Um, will we be much the poorer if we lose a thousand or so species? Well, yes, we damn well will, I think. But it isn't just a thousand or so species. We stand to lose millions of species if we carry on. Um, there are two counter-arguments to this. One is exemplified by the next quote, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Um, he's basically saying, these things might be useful. We don't know what most species actually do, what role they have in ecosystems. We don't know what will happen if they disappear until they disappear. Um, and it may turn out that they're really important in some way. Uh, ecologically or potentially economically, uh, they could be useful to us. And so just throwing away, discarding these resources um, is dumb. Um, but actually, I think there's a better argument. I get a little bit worried about this argument that we, we have to value nature based on its, its usefulness to us, ecosystem services, phrase everyone said, which is, it seems to me a very self-centered way of looking at the world. Um, I think every species on the planet has as much right to be here as we do. Um, and whether or not it's any good to us, we should look after it. Um, the whole ecosystem service thing kind of breaks down, I think, because there are plenty of creatures out there which actually probably don't affect us at all, one way or the other. And if they were to disappear, it wouldn't make a blind bit of difference to us economically. But it would be a shame nonetheless, I think. So, species are going extinct, and those that haven't yet gone extinct are declining in abundance. You're all aware of this. Um, 
There's all sorts of really depressing statistics available about how birds and butterflies and bees and so on are doing. Um, farm and birds are down 58%, I think, since 1970 in terms of total numbers. Um, and it's funny, a lot of these statistics start in 1970 as if that was some sort of golden period for wildlife. Of course, 1970 was seven years after Silent Spring, after those awful pictures that you saw earlier of people spraying pesticides everywhere. Um, the World Wildlife Fund, a couple of years ago, produced an estimate of how the total number of vertebrates on the planet has changed over time. So, vertebrates, birds, fish, reptiles, mammals, and amphibians. It's obviously really hard to estimate how many of them there are on the planet. Um, but they, they, their best guess was that the total number has roughly halved since 1970. Um, so I was five years old in 1970, so in less than my lifetime, the number of vertebrates that we share the planet with has halved. Um, from a period of history where it had probably dropped a lot already. Um, so what's going to be left in another 50 years? Uh, it's a really depressing thought what we might be leaving behind for our grandchildren if we're not careful. This is another interesting uh, recent example which you probably haven't seen. Um, hasn't yet been published, but it's uh, data from Germany where um, a bunch of amateur entomologists have been uh, running malaise traps. This strange thing looks like a tent, which, so I should say this, there are some more positive bits in this talk, just in case you're <laughs> thinking of slitting your wrists at this point. I, it clears up towards the end. Um, they, they run these malaise traps which catch fly insects and uh, they weighed them, the, the catch, the biomass of flying insects per day. And over a 25 year period from 1989 to 2014, the total biomass uh, dropped by 80%. And these traps are all over Germany, so it's not just an isolated local effect. Um, 80%. So that means if you're a bird that eats insects or a bat or whatever, then four fifths of your food has gone in just 25 years. Um, we don't, of course, know whether exactly the same thing is happening here, but I wouldn't be at all surprised. So, what about bees? You're expecting me to talk about bees. Well, before I, before I tell you a little bit more about what's happening to, to their populations, let's just kind of cheer things up a little bit by looking at some nice pictures of some bees. Um, uh, there are, there's an enormous diversity of bees in the world, and many people have no idea. that an awful lot of members of the public think there's one species of bee and it makes honey and it lives in a box. And they don't realise that there are all these other beautiful, wonderful, interesting bees out there. 20,000 species so far that we know of, about 270 in the UK. Um, so let me just show you some bees. I'm sorry, with the sun shining, it's not quite, these aren't quite as nice to look at as they might be, but nonetheless. Uh, so we'll start with some of the less spectacular ones. This is a leaf cutter bee. Um, this, is, this is a species you might find uh, locally. Quite common, There's, there are actually several species of leaf cutter bee that live in our gardens. Um, they're called leaf cutter bees because they like to snip little semicircles out of leaves and they sew them together with silk and line a, a tunnel, which is where they nest. Uh, this is one of the many, many species, the majority of bee species, which is solitary. So many people, most people think bees are all social insects. They're not. Um, bumblebees and honeybees are social insects, but the large majority of species just live on their own, like most insects do. So these, these girls find the tunnel, line it with leaves, uh, suck it with pollen, and lay their eggs. This is another solitary species. This is this is this. So a great name, the hairy footed flower bee. It's not a very helpful name, flower bee, because all the bees visit flowers, but nonetheless. Uh, and it's slightly awkward as well because the females don't have hairy feet either. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, it's called the hairy footed flower bee because the male has big hairy front feet and he uses them to, to stroke the antennae of, of the female while they're mating, which she seems to like. Uh, sadly, these are finished for the year, they're a spring species, but, but beautiful things are found more or less all over Britain. Um, this is the commonest of our solitary bees, the red mason bee. This is the standard occupant of a bee hotel if you go out and buy one. They do work. Uh, it's worth spending a few quid or uh, making one yourself, which is very easy. Uh, and stick it in the sunny, on the sunny fence and you very likely get these things nesting in the spring. There's still a few on the way at the moment. Then there are bees that don't look much like bees at all. Um, uh, this is a cuckoo bee, um, which most people would think was a wasp. Um, Cookie bees are, are bees, so all bees evolved from wasps, 
uh, by 120 million years ago. They're kind of wasp turned vegetarian. Um, but some of them have now become parasites on other bees. Um, so cuckoo bees sneak into the nests of solitary bees, or sometimes social bees, depending on the cuckoo. This species dashes in and lays its eggs in the nest of a solitary bee when the mother's away, and its egg hatch, the eggs hatch very quickly, and they have uh, really big mandibles, specifically for the task of murdering the host's offspring, and then they eat all of its food. Which, just like the bird, um, it's uh, perfectly natural, of course, and we should, we should welcome these uh, fascinating parts of our biodiversity. If we leave Britain, there are some really spectacular bees. I'm not wanting to do down our bees, but this is a, a blue-banded amagilla from Australia, and uh, one of my favourites, if it all comes, so I'm having difficulty getting the slides to change. Um, I, I, it's almost worth flying to China just to see this. I, I think I haven't been there, but um, spectacular. That's a, a carpenter bee. It's a solitary bee, big solitary bee. Carpenter bee because it burrows holes in timber. Amazing thing. Finally, for the exotic section, um, this is an orchid bee. I have seen these things. Really spectacular, beautiful insects. Uh, live in South America and Central America. They're called orchid bees because the, the males um, visit orchids, not for the nectar, but to collect the, the, the floral volatiles, which uh, they have big swollen hind legs that are hollow, and they stuff their hollow hind legs with the, with the volatile chemicals from the orchid. And then when they find a female orchid bee, they waft their legs at her and hope that she likes the bouquet of the <laughs> There are also lots of insects which are easily mistaken for bees that aren't bees. Um, many flies in particular have evolved to mimic bees because that gives them protection from predators. Bees, female bees, have a sting, uh, and therefore many predatory birds uh, will avoid trying to eat bees. Uh, and if you look like a bee, then you, you're relatively safe from being eaten. Um, so there's some beautiful hoverflies in particular that, that, are, that are remarkable mimics of different types of bee and wasp. This really isn't one of them. Um, this is, is a fly, uh, which was unfortunately caught on the cover of Bees of the World. Um, by, by the publishers. Legend has it that they printed 4,000 copies before they showed any to, to, to the authors, and you can imagine they're somewhat irate. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are much better ones than that. Anyway, moving on. Um, bumblebees. These are actually my speciality. The this, this species that I study, I've been studying for about 25 years now. In the UK, we have 25, 26 species. Uh, they're the most obvious of the wild bees you can see flying around in any park, garden, meadow, whatever. Um, and some really beautiful ones. This is the early bumblebee. Uh, common carna, both species you get more or less everywhere in the UK. The red-tailed bumblebee, I'm sure we'll see some of those flying around here today. So, to come back to what I was talking about, population change, declines, the depressing stuff, um, let me just show you a couple of examples. So, so bees aren't faring so well, as, as you know, um, but I'm just going to illustrate that. Um, so firstly, the great yellow bumblebee, a British species which uh, used to be quite widespread in Britain, used to be found pretty close to here by the look of that. Um, this is the distribution between 1900 and 1950. Um, but then the second half of the 20th century was in very rapid decline. And if you want to see one today, you've got a long drive on your hands. You've got to go to the very far north or west of Scotland. It's extinct in England and Wales. Um, it's not the only species to have declined. We've actually lost three species completely from the UK, um, and there's six or seven species which have become extremely rare, like the great yellow, and uh, are, are in danger of going extinct at some point. This, just to give you one more example, this is Franklin's bumblebee, which is a North American species. Um, just so you get your bearings, this is the west coast of North America. This is that's Oregon and California beneath it. Um, and the red dots show you where this species used to be found, but it's now extinct. Um, it's globally extinct, um, which is it's kind of poignant, but nobody took it, even a decent picture of a live one, which is why the only one I can find is one of it on a pin, poor thing. Um, it was quite common up until about 1995, and then started a very rapid decline. Hasn't been seen since 2006, and I've been there looking for it rather pointlessly, but. Um, uh, we think it's gone for good, sadly. So, of course, we should be really worried about this because bees are hugely important. I'm sure you've heard this. 
but bees pollinate, or bees are other insects, uh, pollinate about three quarters of all the crops that people grow in the world, which accounts for by weight about a third of the food that we eat. You might think that seems a bit of a mismatch, but it's because the quarter of the crop types that we grow that don't need insect pollinators tend to be the biggest ones, the wind-pollinated grasses, so things like rice, wheat, maize, uh, barley, um, make up the bulk of our diet by weight, and they don't need these, but all the tasty stuff, all the things that makes our diets great, the tomatoes, the blueberries, the strawberries, the courgettes, the chili peppers, and so on and so on and so on, um, all depend on insects of one type or another, and much of it one type of bee or another. Um, I'm just going to show these are just a couple of lovely pictures I, I was sent which just illustrate uh, why bees are really effective pollinators. Uh, you can just see that, so, so the bee tries to collect the pollen on its hind legs to take back to feed to its offspring. But they, 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 they don't get all of it, and you can see this bee's got pollen all over its fur, uh, some of which will be transferred to the stigma of the next flower, and that's what the flower is after. Um, you can even see here some pollen bees still in flight as the bees try to groom as it flies along, but it's scattering pollen all over the place. Um, so so the bees are really good pollinators, and uh, uh, as I've said, they deliver all of our food. This just kind of illustrates that graphically. Um, there's a lovely supermarket, take away the bees, and that's what would be missing. That's what our supermarkets would look like. Life would be rubbish, eating porridge and bread and rice all day long. Um, so we really should look after our bees. But before I talk about how we can do that, let me just say a little bit about why they've declined. Um, there are really three big reasons. Uh, one is disease. Um, we've spread bee diseases around the world, um, not deliberately of course, but accidentally as we've moved bees around the world, which means that, that wild bees are now infected with non-native diseases that they don't have resistance to. So for example, in the UK, we discovered a couple of years ago that if you go out and catch wild bumblebees, about a quarter of them are flying around with a kind of Asian bee diarrhea, which uh, we don't know how exactly how it got here, but would certainly have been brought by man from Asia. Uh, it's, a, it's an actually naturally a disease of the Asian honeybee. There are lots of other examples, but I won't go into them. The biggest driver is habitat loss, which I'll say a tiny bit more about, and I'll say a bit more about pesticides. So, of course, this is sort of why we're here. Uh, one of the biggest problems that bees face is, is that we used to have loads of lovely flower-rich habitat, uh, flower meadows, and as we heard earlier, we lost somewhere between 97 and 99, depending on who you talk to, percent of the vast areas that used to cover most of Britain. And from a bee's perspective, then it's, it's self-evident that if you destroy, get rid of that and replace it with a silage field, or um, show you that picture again, an arable field, there are no flowers at all. Um, so uh, there's just no food or nowhere to nest. There's nothing uh, for a bee or really for any other kind of wildlife in that monoculture habitat that we've covered large chunks of the world with. Thankfully, there are places where, that have escaped the, this intensification process that went on through the 20th century. There are some really fantastic meadows still left. I gather there are some around here, and hopefully we'll see some uh, later today. This is, this is one of my favourite examples. This is a bit of a way from here, but it's where those great yellow bumblebees still survive. Um, and you can see why they survive there. This is the, this is the macro. This is actually on the South US. Uh, and you get this beautiful carpet of flowers growing uh, on this uh, wind-blown shell sand. Um, really unique habitat and worth a, worth a visit. But it's just simply so remote that farming up there hasn't really changed too much yet. Uh, and hence, uh, still lots of lovely bees and other wildlife to be seen there. There are other examples nearer here. Uh, Salisbury Plain is a brilliant one. Um, huge tracts of land that, that largely escaped uh, at least the worst of agricultural in intensification, simply because they were bought by the army so they could race around in tanks and practice shooting each other. Um, uh, but accidentally, they've created one of the biggest er surviving areas of flower-rich grassland in Western Europe. Um, and it has all sorts of lovely creatures there, um, including, for example, this thing, the shrill carnaby, which is probably the rarest surviving bumblebee in, in England. Um, then there's about seven populations left. One of them is on Salisbury Plain. Lovely little thing. 
<laughs> okay, then the third reason that bees are declining, most of us think, uh, relates to pesticides, which is something that my research group have been studying at Sussex for the last few years. Um, so, apologies for pulling up this, you probably can't read much of it, um, but I'll explain what it is. So, we started working on the effects of pesticides on bees, on farms around Sussex University, which is just outside Brighton, in the uh, edge of the South Downs. And so we contacted local farmers and we asked them if they could tell us what pesticides they use on every field. Um, and we had five farms who gave us data for all of their fields. Uh, this, just, this is one example of one field, which was, happened to be sown with oilseed rape, but it, it, the, the list would be similar for a wheat field. Um, this is the list of the chemicals applied to one oilseed rape crop between when it was harvested, sorry, when it was sown in uh, late August uh, 2012 and when it was harvested in June 2013. So it gets 22 different chemicals, two of which are fertilizers, 20 different types of pesticides, including insecticides, molluscicides, herbicides, and fungicides, all going onto one crop just to get it to grow to harvest, apparently. I, I was quite astonished when I saw this. Um, I still am, uh, several years later. And this wasn't a bad farmer. This guy is he's doing his best. He's just following the advice of his agronomists. On average, farmers in East Sussex use slightly fewer pesticides uh, on their crops than the UK average. So this is not atypical at all. Um, but you can see why, if you are, for example, a bee, uh, this might be an issue. Or, in fact, anything wanting to live in this field. Um, there are five or six different insecticides going on to this crop. Without going into the details, um, I would just ask you this. If you're growing fruit and veg in your garden to eat yourself or to feed to your kids, would you feel comfortable sticking 20 different pesticides on it before you harvested it? Um, I'd be surprised if any of you would. Um, I certainly wouldn't. Um, I grow plenty of fruit and veg perfectly well without using any of these things. Um, uh, so there are issues here not just relating to the health of bees, but relating to the health of people and just generally everything that lives in our uh, environment. Uh, because this, of course, means that our food is contaminated with an awful lot of stuff. Anyway, I'm going to say a little tiny bit more about one particular chemical here, or one group of chemicals, the neonicotinoids, which you've all heard of, I'm sure. This crop was right at the top, I can't, there's no pointer on here, but it says thiamethicsum, top centre. This was a seed treatment put on this crop. That's one of these neonicotinoids, which you've probably heard about as being particularly implicated uh, as potentially driving bee declines. So I see how we're doing for time. We're all right. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about them and why I think we should be concerned. So neonicotinoids are insecticides and neurotoxins related to nicotine, introduced in 1994. Um, they became very popular. So that just shows you how the weight applied to the UK increased over time. Um, they mostly use as a seed dressing. So this funny purple stuff, that's oilseed rapeseed that's been coated with the insecticide and they're supposed to be drawn up, they're systemic, so they're drawn up by the crop as it grows and they go to all parts of it and make it toxic to pest insects eating the crop. That's the idea at least. Unfortunately, it means that they go into the pollen and the nectar too. So if it's a flowering crop like oilseed rape, then bees that go to pollinate the crop will be getting a dose of neurotoxin. And they're really potent neurotoxins. So the toxicity of the chemical is measured by uh, a, an LD50 test, which stands for the lethal dose that kills 50%. Um, the, 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 the dose that's lethal to a honeybee of one of these near the cotinoids, this is a different one in the decoctrin, but they're all broadly similar. It's, it takes four nanograms, that's four billionths of a gram, to kill a honeybee. Um, put that in context or to try and understand that, that means that one teaspoon of these chemicals is enough to kill one and a quarter billion honeybees, and we're applying, you can see the scale, about 110,000 kilos of this stuff to the UK every year. Um, just compare it to DDT, which is obviously not great stuff to have applied 35 years ago, um, but it's, it's weight for weight about 7,000 times less toxic DDT is than this new generation of insecticides. Not saying we should go back to DDT. Um, they're also available for garden use, or at least some of them are, and I would just say please don't. 
Um, and you should also be aware that if you drip stuff on the back of your dog's neck, which your vet will try and persuade you to do as a prophylactic treatment against fleas, you can't read it, but it just says imidacloprid in tiny, tiny letters on the box. Um, it's the same stuff. Um, the dose you're supposed to drip on the neck of a medium-sized dog every month is enough to kill 60 million honeybees, or 60 partridges, probably one dog, if it weren't put on the back of its neck where it can't lick it. But then, don't you stroke the back of your dog's neck, your children give it a hug, put their face in that neck that you've just put neurotoxin on? Doesn't seem like such a great idea to me, but anyway. Um, so I always show you this slide, it just kind of exemplifies for me um, some of the greenwash that goes on here. The companies that make these chemicals want to tell you that they really love bees. They love the environment. They don't. Uh, they love money. Um, anyway, so they had this special promotion a couple of years ago. This is Bayer, one of the, the people who just invented neonics in the first place. Free seeds for bees with your bee-killing chemicals. So you can, you can grow lovely flowers, trapped in lots of pollinators, and then kill them with your bug gun. So you probably don't use any pesticides in your garden, I would guess, or very few, because you're at this conference. Um, uh, I don't, as I said, uh, but I do buy pretty flowers from my local garden centre, and I, I tend to buy the ones with logos like that that say they're being friendly, or the RHS one perfect for pollinators. Uh, because they look so beautiful and tempting, and, and, and I know if I plant them in my garden, bees will come flocking to them straight away. Um, but unfortunately, if you do that, then there's a very high chance you will also be introducing a whole bunch of pesticides to your garden. So we just, last year, we went out and bought a whole bunch of bee-friendly plants from a range of different garden centers, um, so including most of the big names, some of the big names. And we analyzed them for pesticides. Um, and this isn't a very great slide to summarize it, but this, each row is, a, is one bee-friendly plant that we bought. And this is just the number of different insecticides and fungicides in the plant. Um, but just to give you some throwaway statistics, all but two of 29 plants we bought had um, pesticides in them. 70% had neonicotinoids in them. And these are plants being sold by the garden centre, marketed as bee-friendly, and they mostly contain deadly neurotoxins that kill bees. Um, plus a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, and I, we've been trying to make as many people aware of this as possible, to put pressure on people like the RHS to clean up their act. But so far, it's, they've just kept their head down. I think it's been seven weeks since this study came out, and there's no response at all. They seem to think it's fine to carry on. I think this is absolutely shocking, and we need to do something about it. Anyway, to finish off the doom and gloom, um, if we, if the, the, so bee declines are not all due to neonicotinoids. Uh, they're not all due to any one thing. They're due to a combination of things. The poor bee, is, is basically being stressed from all sides. There's, there's very little habitat that's rich in flowers left, so they're hungry. They're infected by these foreign diseases I briefly mentioned, and they're being exposed not just to neonicotinoids, but to a whole cocktail of different pesticides. And these things interact. There are synergies between them. It's common sense, but there's also good scientific evidence showing that if a bee is, for example, hungry, it becomes more susceptible to pesticides and diseases, and vice versa. Um, so um, it's little wonder if the poor bees are hungry and infected and poisoned all at the same time, that they sometimes die. Um, but we can fix some of those things. Uh, some are easier to fix than others. Uh, we, what we need to avoid is this. You've probably seen these pictures before, but it's people hand-pollinating their apple and pear orchards in China because they've killed all the bees. Um, we need to make sure we don't do that. Uh, one solution is to build robot bees to replace them. Um, there are people seriously suggesting this. It terrifies the hell out of me. Um, and I think it's actually completely absurd. The cost of building a fleet of robots to replace our bees. Bees are pretty good at pollinating. They've been doing it for 120 million years. And they're free, and they give us honey, and they're biodegradable and carbon neutral and everything else. These things aren't. Can you imagine? building, there were three trillion honeybees in the world. If you just wanted to replace that one species of bee, you need three trillion robots. What's that going to cost? Uh, anyway, um, I, I'm sure you don't need me to persuade you that this is not the way to go. Um, so what can we do? Well, there are lots of things we can do. Obviously, the, the purpose of this meeting is focused on recreating and looking after the, the, the flower-rich meadows that, that survive and trying to add to them. And that's probably the, the, one of the biggest things that we, we could do. 
I'm not an expert in restoring flat, uh, species rich grasslands, although I, um, I did buy a little farm down in France to do exactly that, and have written a book about it, and, and that's been a really great experience. Well said. Um, <laughs> but there are other people here that can tell you more about the details about how best to do that than, than I. Uh, but clearly, if we can put back little patches of flower <coughs> habitat into the countryside, that will really help. Um, if you don't have a farm or a meadow, then just really simple things like not mowing so often on your, uh, of your lawn really helps. This is, this is just a little bit of my lawn, and, and it's, it's covered in bees. And all you need to do is just not cut it. Um, uh, almost every lawn has clovers and birds foot trefoils and selfie and buttercups and all sorts of stuff lurking and trying to flower. So just give it a chance. Um, we also might look at road verges and roundabouts and, yeah. and amenity par uh, parks and so on, amenity grasslands of which we have so many in our towns and cities, and most of which, again, are just mown all the time. This is a lovely example from uh, Stirling up in Scotland, where I used to be based, where there's a local campaign group that uh, dig up these, they, they get permission, and then they go in at weekends and, and, and plant wildflower seeds. You can see this is an annual mix, but uh, fantastic. Uh, number of butterflies there, when there would have been absolutely nothing living there before they came along. Uh, the last count, there were 50 odd patches like this dotted around Stirling. Why can't we do that in every city? It'd be great. Um, that's a roundabout. Um, we also do need to do more to keep kids engaged with nature, and I think this is one of the big worries that sort of relates to something that, that Steve said. Um, but we have this kind of shifting baseline, and we also have Generations of children growing up in cities, um, with 82% of the British population live in cities, and they don't get the opportunities that maybe many of us did to engage with nature well, uh, as children. Uh, and so they grow up, well, young children tend, I think, to be innately fascinated by bugs. But by the time they're teenagers, they've usually lost that, and their reaction to anything that buzzes is to swat it or be frightened of it, which is really sad, and we somehow need to combat that. This just shows you uh, before and after shots. This is a primary school class up in the Western Isles of Scotland where we, we uh, when I was part of the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, we got uh, money to develop a, a, a two-hour lesson about bumblebees. And at the beginning, the kids were asked to draw a bumblebee, and they draw these rubbish pictures, black and sort of blobby things with yellow and black stripes. Uh, so they're only seven, so I was, I just, no, that sounded rude. But anyway, um, two hours later, we taught them all about bumblebees, and they, we asked them to draw one again, and they drew these beautiful diagrams with two pairs of wings and three pairs of legs and everything like they should be, which doesn't matter in the slightest. What does matter is, look, this kid up here, with that big, that, I don't know what he was drawing, that's the worst bumblebee ever, but he looked really unimpressed. But then there he is, two hours later, with a huge smile on his face, and uh, you can't see his bumblebee, but it was much better than the first one. Those, this is, this is kids that live in a crofting community up where those great yellow bumblebees are. And actually, this was taken about eight years ago, so they'll be probably driving the tractor now, and hopefully they'll remember that lesson. But it would obviously be great if it was more than one lesson, and not just about bees, but about generally about nature. And yeah, it would, it would be great if it was even built into the curriculum every week, every day, ideally. There are, I'm nearly finished. There are, there are other things we can do. You can get involved in citizen science projects to help look after these. There are loads in Britain, um, or almost too many, I sometimes think. We, there's a, an organisation called the Buzz Club based at the University of Sussex that I'm involved with. Check it out on the internet if, you wanna, uh, if you'd like to find out more about what you can do in your garden in particular to look after wildlife and help us collect useful data about how populations are changing. Uh, then do get involved. Great way, a great thing for kids to do as well. Finally, you can make your garden more bee-friendly by planting the right kinds of flowers not bought from your local garden centre, ideally. Um, from an organic garden centre, or grow your own from seed, or plant swap with a neighbour, much more environmentally friendly than going to Wyvale or somewhere. Um, it's just some quick do's and don'ts about flowers. Um, so, you might think that all flowers are good for bees, but actually they're not. Um, some are absolutely rubbish. And the plant breeding process that, that, that has gone on over the, over the decades and centuries has produced all sorts of weird and wonderful uh, sports of natural flowers um, that are often um, uh, grown and sold ornamentally. But actually, some of them have, have lost their original purpose. All flowers originally evolved to attract insects uh, to, to, so that they would be pollinated. That's what a flower is for. And it's really sad that some modern flowers have lost that purpose. You may as well just have plastic flowers. 
Um, so this just shows you two roses. This is a lovely wild type rose, which has loads of insects on it. Uh, that is a mutant in which the, the anthers that produce the pollen are instead expressed as petals. So you might think it looks really pretty, but from a bee's perspective, it's absolute rubbish. Um, so next time you're buying a rose, go for one of those, and the bees will thank you for it. Um, so get rid of all of these horrible annual bedding plants. Um, get rid of them. I don't really know what the gnome is there. You just, um, and grow some of these instead. You, 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 I'm sure you already know good plants for bees. Uh, if you don't, check out my university webpage or the Buzz Club or in fact umpteen other online sites which will give you advice. There are lots of wildflowers that you can also grow in your garden which are, uh, are um, great for bees. And people sometimes think that wildflowers will become weeds in their gardens. It's after all flowers were wildflowers once. Of course a few things will become weeds. Probably this might be worth avoiding unless you want to be doing a lot of digging them up. But, uh, but great for bees, all of them. Um, so just to finish off, um, this is where we live, on this funny round rock floating in, in space. It's hundreds of billions of miles through the icy wastes of space to anywhere else where there might possibly be life. Um, and it's quite extraordinary that we were, we were lucky enough to be born onto, onto this planet that we share with maybe 10 million other species, all sorts of weird and wonderful creatures, many of which we haven't even discovered yet. Um, this should be the most important thing to us. It is everything to us, and yet we don't seem to appreciate that. We've been spectacularly irresponsible with this planet so far. Uh, so we really do now, at this point in history, need to get our act together and do everything we can think of to, to reverse what's happening, or else future generations will inherit a really impoverished world. Um, but it's great to see so many people, and I really do feel there is maybe a moment at this point in history where we can turn things around and we have to bloody well do our best. So thank you all for listening. Dave, thank you very much. I think if Steve's going to send the book to Michael Gove, we need to package you up and send you to yes. Michael Gove as well. <laughs> so um, there's a few moments for questions. Um, Stephen spoke about being evangelical. How would you go about trying to act against the sort of Monsanto Bay kind of axis of not listening to what people want? It's, it's, it is difficult. I mean, that is the, one of the, the fundamental problem of the modern world is it's run by big business to make money and not, you know, with any, any thought for the sustainability or the future of the planet or the human race. Uh, and it's very difficult to know what, what we do. I mean, we, we need to vote for politicians who will be more responsible, who care about the environment. We need to somehow ha get people in charge of the country that care. And it's really heartening to see that, that, that Labour have finally started talking a bit about the environment. Up until this last um, election, I hadn't for years heard anyone but the Green Party even mention the environment. So that's one thing. we. Do, um, but there are there are a million small things we can do. I mean, you can vote with your feet. You, you they make their money um, by people ultimately buying the food that is produced in that way. So if we all s s insisted on buying our food from local, sustainably produced farmers, uh, maybe organic is part of the answer. Um, then that would reduce their power, their profit. Um, I, but I'm no expert on you know, how do we fight corporate greed. It's, it's a yeah, huge issue. But what we need to tackle if we're going to save the planet. <laughs> now, you suggested that growing from seed. Have you done any studies on commercial seed in the same way that you've done on plants? We know, so farmer's seeds are routinely treated with stuff. Uh, a whole but, you know, but, but, but for everyday gardeners, I... As, I don't know for sure, but I think seeds are not normally treated with pesticides. Uh, and certainly by the time you've grown a seed, it, they're not going to be treated with neonicotinoids, I'm pretty certain. Um, so it, it's certainly safer to grow things from seed um, than, than buying it. If you buy, if you buy a ready-grown plant, it's almost certainly full of pesticides. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave and I follow each other on Twitter. So one of the latest tweets from Crop Science UK, um, which is Bayer basically, is uh, in response to the latest 
um, big evidence review that yeah. CH have done about neonicotinoids. They say of the 254 honeybee analyses reported by CH, 238 had no effect, seven were positive and only nine were negative. Hashtag do neonics really harm bees? So I was going to wonder what your response was to <laughs> bees. So, so yeah, there, there, there were two big new studies came out yesterday on uh, the effects of neonics on bees. Both of them, the scientists' conclusions were neonics do, yes, harm bees, as all, we all knew already. Um, but industry are doing their best, as always, to spin this to sow confusion and doubt in every way they can. They had those results six months ago because they actually, ironically this time, they funded that study. Uh, they agreed to the experimental design, but now they're disagreeing with the findings and trying to distance themselves from it. Um, I think any reason, it's like climate change, you can still find a few people that will deny it, um, people who make money from denying it, um, but any sane rational person at this point in time has to accept that these things really do contribute to bee declines. They're not, you know, the only problem at all, as I said, um, but just please, d you know, don't be taken in anybody by the crap that they spout. They have, you know, teams of lobbyists who've been working on how best to confuse people and especially politicians so that they don't act over this latest evidence. Um, uh, it is sometimes very depressing, but I think they are losing this battle. The, unfortunately, the bigger picture is that they will, I'm pretty sure that, that the pesticide companies have been anticipating neonics being banned for some years now and probably have the next generation of nasty chemical lined up ready to roll out as soon as the ban comes into effect. So that's the bigger picture is we need to move away from farming, where farmers are applying 20 odd different pesticides. It doesn't matter what they are, that, that type of approach to food production is destroying the environment. Do Bayer or Monsanto do any of their studies on anything else, any of the other pollinators other than honeybees? The, well, so this latest work, they didn't do it, they paid for it, but it was on honeybees, bumblebees and uh, osmia. Um, and found negative effects against all three. Slightly muddier for the honeybees, very clear for bumblebees and osmia. Uh, they don't normally do that much research themselves, um, but uh, whenever they do, of course, they never find any harm to anything. And they, they, they are, it's actually absurd when you think about it. You know, 110,000 kilos of incredibly toxic chemicals, and they, they basically, their line is it doesn't harm wildlife at all. You don't really actually need to do any more studies than that, do you? It's obviously nuts. But, uh... Gentlemen at the back. Uh, perhaps playing devil's advocate and throwing the GM word into the uh, debate now, is, in your opinion, the way round this conundrum we have in protecting our crops to really go down the GM route much faster than, uh, than we are best to do at the I, some of you might be surprised to hear me say that I don't think GM is, is necessarily evil. Um, I think it has potential, but I, it, what, I think the bigger problem with GM is that it's being developed and, and, and uh, promoted by the same companies that produce the pesticides, um, Monsanto, et al., um, and their motive is making money, and thus far in the United States, where they have lots of GM, it hasn't resulted in any environmental benefits at all. Um, in fact, many GM crops are accompanied with more pesticides than, than the non-GM crops. So, as currently practiced, it will not help in the slightest. But I think, in theory, um, if someone, you know, perhaps funded by government, were developing GM crops, with the specific aim of reducing pesticide use, producing uh, a, a crop that was more environmentally friendly in some way, um, then yeah, it, it could be useful. And perhaps we shouldn't have this, you know, sort of tunnel vision on GM. I'm going to take one last question. Sorry, the lady in the middle, please. Um, would you advocate online petitions, and if so, which do you think are effective? <laughs> Well, it doesn't take more than a few seconds to sign them, but I, I don't know. I mean, 38 degrees are endlessly running campaigns. You get 100,000 signatures or whatever, what does it actually do? So there was a neonic one a couple of years ago which forced a debate in Parliament about neonics. But you can watch that debate on Parliament TV, and it involved about 25 slightly bored-looking MPs with no decision-making power at all, and no knowledge between a lot of them about the subject they were debating. 
So they just bundled on a bit. Some of them saying, oh, I hear these chemicals are quite bad for bees. And someone else saying, yes, yes, I've heard the same thing. And then after an hour or two, they all go away. The cheap absolutely bugger all, as far as I could see. But uh, it does no harm. And, you know, we, we need to put pressure on politicians one way or another, whether it's by wearing a bee suit and marching up and down outside the Houses of Parliament or signing petitions or buying, changing the buying choices or all of those things and everything else you can think of. Who knows? And voting choices. Voting choices, absolutely, yeah. Okay, I'm going to stop the questions there because there is a question and answer session at the end of the day. Can I thank both speakers this morning? I think, actually at one level, a really depressing picture of decline and so forth, but delivered in a, a humorous way. Uh, and I think today also demonstrates that we can all make a difference, doesn't it? So, you know, the Meadow Makers Group and so forth, you being here, what we can do as individuals can make a difference. And I think, hopefully, by the end of the day, we'll all go out there knowing what we can do as individuals. Um, next bit is the breakout groups. So, um, if I've got this correct, there are four breakout sessions. Um, if you can't remember which one you registered for, don't worry, because you didn't register for one. <laughs> so, I'd say it was deliberate. So the first one is Wildflower Identification Workshop, which Sarah Jennings is leading as county ecologist. Um, now this one, there are 10 spaces, only 10, and it's first come, first served. Okay. Andy, Andy <laughs> sit right down. <laughs> I suppose, as the host, he's allowed to make a bash for the door. <laughs> uh, Gabrielle's intervened from the back. So, uh, so the first one is wildflower identification, um, and that's in the tent. Okay. Second one.